Hello everyone, my name is Michelle Angelo Rocha and I'm a PhD candidate in Educational Leadership and Policy Studies at the University of South Florida. The following video is a shot that was recorded at the International Congress of Qualitative Inquiry ICQI 2021. This is the second video of four sections, so if you didn't have time yet to check the first video, so check it out on our YouTube channel. This project was organized by the editors of the book Analyzing Interpreting Qualitative Research at the interview Dr. Charles Vanover, Paul Mijas, and Johnny Saldana, and published by SAGE. In this second section, you will learn about interpretation and writing strategies at the interview. The first presentation is called Memo Writing Strategies, Analyzing the Parts and the Whole by Paul Mijas from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. The second one is Memoing, a core generative tool of qualitative analysis with Dr. Elaine Ken, the National University of Ireland, Galway. The third presentation is Listening Deeply, an alternative to approach to the analysis of focus groups conversations with Jamie Lee Fiedler from the University of Calgary. And the discussant is Johnny Saldanian from the Arizona State University. So get comfortable and enjoy this section too. And if you didn't have time yet, go there and check out our section one too. In this second section, you will learn about interpretation and writing strategies after the interview. The first presentation is called Memo Writing Strategies, Analyzing the Parts and the Whole by Paul Mijas from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. The second one is Memoing, a core generative tool of qualitative analysis with Dr. Elaine Ken, the National University of Ireland, Galway. The third presentation is Listening Deeply, an alternative to approach to the analysis of focus groups conversations with Jamie Lee Fiedler from the University of Calgary. And the discussant is Johnny Saldanian from the Arizona State University. So get comfortable and enjoy this section too. And if you didn't have time yet, go there and check out our section one too. Great, thanks, thanks so much. So I am um, presenting today on memo writing strategies, analyzing the parts in the whole. As we know, there are many ways that researchers make sense of copious amounts of narrative data. I find that memo writing can sometimes be underutilized in the qualitative research life cycle, and that researchers may not be sure of how to fully use memos as anal analytic ways of knowing. Memo writing incorporates various investigative lenses. It can be both exploratory as well as more strategically analytical. Memos develop a researcher's conversation with the data and can serve as a precursor, a companion, or a follow-up to coding. As a method of inquiry, memo writing moves us closer to knowledge production. Initially, our thoughts may be speculative. We write through our doubt. As a precursor to coding, memos on key quotations capture our close reading of text. A close reading suggests empirical intimacy, to use a term by Marcello Chuzzi, dwelling in data and moving closer to the research problem in the participant's textured language. An especially pragmatic memo is what I call the document reflection memo, a record of the researcher's holistic understanding of a single transcript. In a document reflection memo, we are more likely to notice participant beliefs redolent in a transcript or a way of framing experience that inhabits an entire interview. Here, we attempt to hold in our mind the interview context, casting a net around a larger emotional and psychological landscape. Repetitions and patterns are evident throughout a single interview lead us to contiguity as a source of coherence, to use a phrase from Joseph Maxwell. Rather than immediately fragmenting the data into text segments, contiguity privileges holism. Even in a semi-structured interview, there is an, 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 there is an unfolding logic as the participant works their way through the topics and reveals a cumulative perspective. In this way, we are attentive to the flow of logic in the transcript, rather than interrupting the story by pulling out quotations. That will come later.
Here's an example of a, do of a document reflection memo based on a 15,000 word interview with Jenny, a hurricane survivor in, East in Eastern North Carolina. The memo not only condenses a long transcript, connecting pr critical parts of the transcript into a cohesive whole, but also specifically addresses the research question, how do individuals make sense of living through a hurricane? In this example, the memo weaves together Jenny's thoughts about being a refugee, her need for physical help, her possible loss of identity, the parallel lives her neighbors are experiencing, and the all-consuming nature of seeking stability under one's own roof. In other words, it puts quotations in conversation with each other and invites us to write about the conceptual glue that holds them together. Later, we can look across document reflection memos to perhaps develop typo typologies, such as types of survivors. The document reflection memo is extremely practical and helps us remember that participants rem helps us remember the participants as individuals. In contrast to the document level memo, a key quotation memo, what I call a pulse or power quote memo, to use terms from Ray Maeda of Research Talk, focuses on a quotation that is especially illustrative in its content or tone. By unpacking the participants' language in a single quotation, researchers have a window into rationale, the story individuals are telling themselves, moving closer to seeing the world as participants see it. Here's a pulse quotation from Jenny's transcript, one that caught my attention because it elucidates her shifting relationship with her neighbors during the aftermath of the flooding. She says, I had a neighbor stop by and talk this morning. It's like there is a closeness and you can share the same things. Our lives are somewhat the same right now. A memo on a key quotation can, can go beyond description to conceptual reflection of nascent meanings. The function of this kind of memo is to open up the quotation and to attempt to make sense of the participants' own insights, to make sense of their sense-making. Here's an example of this type of memo, which led me to the idea, of, uh, uh, idea or process that I called recognizing a new intimacy. This memo captures Jenny's awareness that she shares increasing similarities with others, with, whom, others, with others whom she might otherwise see as different. Because memo writing slows us down in a good way, we generate ideas that may also help us with coding. Though we might think we don't have time for these memos, they in fact make us more efficient because they invite us to develop clarity and precision and abstraction sooner rather than later. Key quotation memos can focus on a process, behavior, or implicit or explicit action, how participants act, react, or interact. This memo became a seed for more formal writing once I had reviewed additional transcripts. That is, I developed this memo into a more encompassing memo on a process recognizing a new intimacy identifiable across data where I was able to analyze what activated it, what destabilized it, and what kept it in place. A power quote can serve as a story's fuse box, sparking understanding of how we might read other parts of the transcript. A power quote might also serve as a hinge, partway through an interview, looking forward and backward, connecting the past to the present or to the imagined future. Another kind of memo I'd like to talk about is writing about two or more quotations from the same transcript. Writing about how quotations echo, contradict, or complicate each other is a way of analyzing the inscribed meaning between pieces of text. Inscribed meaning points to the arc of meaning surfacing between parts of a transcript. We do not read a quotation in isolation. We read it in light of earlier quotations, as if there is a subtextual arc connecting them. Inscribed meaning is the connective tissue that holds these quotations together in our minds, each quotation unlocking unknowns about the other. For example, in the first quotation below, Jenny discusses time as a resource, that, that how time as a resource has seemed to diminish. In reference to her neighbor, she says, we've not had time to talk to our neighbors to find out really what happened to each one. Later in the interview, she mentions how a FEMA agent did not make time for her. He just, he just didn't have time, she says. It was like he walked through and walked right back out. The first quotation addresses time as a barrier, whereas the second one addresses time in the hands of authority. In the first quote, I see Jenny, due to overwhelm, experiences time as a depleted resource. Finding time for a conversation with a neighbor is now a luxury, something she must po postpone. In the second quote, she comments on the FEMA employee's arrogance because he didn't, did not make time for her. Assessing similarity and difference between quotations is another source of coherence, as is contiguity. With this in mind, a memo on these two quotations might focus on the tension regarding time. Jenny understands her own lack of time as one of scarcity, but presents the female representative and outsider as someone with control over time. The inscribed meaning between these quotations invites us to look into the tension between these two assumptions. Anal analyzing these quotations side by side, holding them in suspended inquiry, brings to the surface more clearly that time is capital in the aftermath of a natural disaster. While Jenny is at the mercy of time, she presents authority figures as having control over time. 
they can decide how many days Jenny has access to the laundry trailer. Hence, they seem arrogant when they are not generous with their time, whereas Jenny sees her own lack of time as insurmountable. Time as a commodity divides the haves and the have-nots. Have the final type of memo that I would like to talk about briefly is what I call the parts whole memo. In this memo, researchers take advantage of the connection between a key quotation and the document itself. By connection, I'm referring to how the part can unlock our understanding of the whole, just as the pattern in, in this leaf reinforces the shape of the tree that it comes from. In our composition, the relationship between the part and the whole is referred to as compositional ellipses. As we see in this figure, the composition makes use of an oval. As we look closer, a larger oval encaps encapsulates another oval, reinforcing this pattern. In other words, compositional ellipses connect and tie together specific elements to create a sense of coherence. In applying this idea to data analysis, we address what a key quotation suggests about the larger contextual document, if and how the DNA of the whole is contained in the part. Here's an example of a quote I used as a flashlight to illuminate the whole. This is from a hurricane survivor, Kurt. The quote describes Kurt's growing realization that he's experiencing a hurricane. First, he notices the water, then the weather report on TV, then his gut feeling, and then noticing water rising before his eyes, and finally seeing his neighbor trying to get his attention. At the end of the paragraph, Kurt says, I knew we were in bad shape. This is not an instant instantaneous reaction to a single moment. It is a conclusion based on incremental awareness, layers of evidence received through multiple sources before he reaches this certitude. I next considered the document as a whole and how Kurt rescued 17 people, but did not see himself as a hero while he was doing so. The hero label only occurs to him later in the interview after he absorbs several layers of information. Though people comment on his bravery as he goes from flooded house to house, it didn't occur to him until later that his actions were courageous. In writing the parts whole memo, I attempted to make a deeper sense I attempted to make deeper sense of a process or structure, in this case, the process of cumulative awareness. In this memo, I was able to describe how Kurt made sense of his heroism during the storm. Just as it takes multiple sources of information for Kurt to acknowledge that he is in fact experiencing hurricane, it takes multiple rescues and cumulative awareness for him to acknowledge in the interview as a whole, his larger than life heroic actions, and in fact, a new, a new identity as hero. These are what writer Charles Baxter calls rhyming actions, actions that are, not, that are not identical, but that sound the same, that share similar characteristics at their core. In other words, cum cumulative awareness is not simply a code to be applied to a single quotation. It characterizes the structure of the interview itself one in which the participant comes to, to terms with a new identity. A parts whole memo can highlight the participant's process of meaning making and document two levels of evidence, the fragmented quotation and the larger content and structure of the narrative taking shape in the, in the contiguous interview itself. So I'm going to stop there and I'm going to pass the baton to Elaine Keane, who will be joining us um, via a recording. Hello everyone. My talk today is about memoing being a core generative tool of qualitative analysis. I'm Elaine Kane. I'm senior lecturer here in the School of Education at the National University of Ireland in Galway, here in the west of Ireland, uh, where my areas of expertise are sociology of education and research methods, especially uh, constructivist grounded theory. So I've been teaching the constructivist grounded theory uh, workshop here at ICQI since 2015. Um, and over the last year have been delighted as well to contribute to Charlie, Paul and Johnny's new book after the interview. My chapter in their book is on uh, critical analytical memoing. So in this presentation, I'm going to share some of my points with, um, from that chapter with you. Now, given the time difference uh, between the West of Ireland and where you all are, um, in, um, in, in your respective homes. Um, I've decided not to subject you uh, to a live presentation from me in the middle, uh, from what would be the middle of the night uh, Irish time, so hence this recording. Okay, so I'm just going to give you a little overview of what I'm going to talk to you about today. So I'm going to make some, for start off with some introductory comments, uh, just in relation to memoing in general. Then I'm going to go on to two different types of memos that I talk through in the chapter. One, um, which are kind of preparatory memos which in which I talk about storing the data on a more descriptive level before we move then to the more conceptual memos and I'll talk through that. Next, I look at a number of different techniques that you can use in conjunction with memoing, for example, diagramming um, and 
how you can actually use memoing to increase the critical analytic power of your work. So we'll talk about that in more detail uh, when we come on to it. Okay, and then I sum up and conclude. So to start with some introductory points, memoing is a key feature of constructivist grounded theory, but also of many different qualitative research methodologies. You certainly don't have to be doing grounded theory to engage in memoing, as I'm sure you're aware. There are also different types of memos and they're used in different ways and different methodologies. Now here, given my grounded theory background, I am focusing, and I also do in the chapter, on using memoing to raise the analytic and conceptual level of one's writing and one's analysis. When and how to memo are important considerations. And in this regard, I've always liked Barney Glazer's dictum to stop and memo. Whenever you get an idea to interrupt whatever you are doing, where feasible, to stop and memo and to allow yourself significant freedom in that regard. So don't censor yourself, don't worry about correct grammar and so on. Allow your thoughts to flow and try to get them down on paper. Try to capture your thinking. And remember, this is just you in conversation, essentially with yourself. While certainly memoing helps you to record your ideas, it is much more than that. And this is one of my core arguments in the chapter in the book, that memoing is essentially generative of our ideas, that the very process of writing helps us to think and to produce our ideas, or as Barney Glazer says, to grow our ideas. Now, there are different types of memos, and we engage in uh, different types of memo writing, depending on what stage we are at in the writing process. So for example, our early memos may really be quite short, certainly less analytic often, but later memos become much more complex um, and are generally uh, becoming at higher levels analytically and conceptually. So moving on now to early memos and looking um, at what they look like and how we go about them. What I call in the chapter, preparatory memos. Now, while certainly in grounded theory, an aim of memoing, as I said earlier, is to raise the analytic, analytic level of our writing, we may well start by storing the data, what Glazer says, storing the data, often in quite a descriptive fashion. And this involves describing the data relating to a particular code or concept or category or aspect of our data, an issue in our data, often participant by participant. And in these sort of preparatory memos, we bring the participants words directly into our writing. Um, and this helps us to illuminate what we are starting to see happening in our data. And what's great about this approach to early memoing is that, of course, it allows you to start somewhere. It's a solution to what is often termed the terror of the blank page. It really does allow us to start um, to start somewhere. Now here you can see an example of a preparatory memo excerpt from my chapter in the book. And this is from my study about the experiences in higher education in university of students from different social class backgrounds. So what you can see here in this excerpt, I take it participant by participant, describing their experience in relation to this thing this, and the thing here or the code here was in relation to the way they spoke about progressing to higher education being a kind of a natural done thing versus a big step. So I took it participant by participant and described what each participant I suppose um, related in relation to this particular code that I was memoing. Now importantly I also use this relatively preparatory memoing phase to, concept, to commence some, um, some basic conceptual work. So during this phase, I was very much alert in my writing, in my memo writing, to conceptual insights and relationships. And I noted those as they occurred to me. But I also then, after finishing the kind of preparatory work of the memo, I reviewed the contents of the preparatory memo afterwards, and I deliberately engaged through the constant comparative method in trying to identify conceptual properties and relationships. So the constant comparative method in grounded theory, essentially, it's exactly what it says on the tin. You're constantly comparing first data with data, then data with codes, codes with codes, codes with categories and so on. And through that process, we are able to extricate 
um, and illuminate the various properties and aspects or bits of our emerging concepts and categories. So you can see here towards the end of this preparatory memo, some of the conceptual thinking that I was starting to do here, extricating some different properties or aspects of the code and category and trying to raise them to a more conceptual level in preparation for the writing of the more conceptual memo. So then moving on to conceptual memos. Well, later on in the research process, our memos just become need to become more advanced and certainly in grounded theory, much more conceptual in nature. Now, Glazer has explained that the very nature of the constant comparative method that I described um, just there a few minutes ago, that the very nature of the, of the constant comparative method facilitates conceptualization, that that very process of comparing data with data, data with codes, codes with codes, and so on, that we are able to delineate properties of and relationships between aspects of our analysis. And articulating those processes actually helps us to articulate the conceptual rela relationships in our data. Now, an important tool in this work is asking analytic questions of our data, as um, Anselm Strauss, another, the other founder of Grounded Theory, has emphasized. So, for example, um, the sorts of analytic questions I ask about of my data um, in my more conceptual memos include, you know, what's going on here? What seems to have led to this happening? What are the conditions under which this occurs? What seems to have happened as a result of this? And what I have found extremely useful in this regard um, is Barney Glazer's uh, different coding families, different theoretical coding families, of which there are at least 18. But one of uh, the coding families in particular that I find particularly useful are his six C's. So you can see here the causes, context, contingencies, consequences, covariances, and uh, covariances and conditions. So, for example, in my conceptual memos, when I was trying to understand what's going on here and what are the relationships between aspects of my data um, in this memo, I would have asked quite cause and effect um, conceptualization based questions of my data. What factor or factors may have led to this happening? What seems to have happened then as a result of this? So you can see the cause and effect type conceptualizations. So we try then to answer these questions within our memos, but to do so requires um, engagement in what grounded theorists call abductive reasoning. Uh, where we consider all, all possible theoretical explanations for a particular phenomenon. And then crucially, we return to our data um, through a kind of an iterative back and forth process to check them out. Now that also allows us to see very quickly um, what we have in terms of data adequacy. Do we have enough data to address these questions that are arising from our ongoing analysis? <clears throat> from a ground theory perspective, of course, that sets us up very nicely to return to the field and to engage in theoretical sampling to gather more data to, um, to fill some of the conceptual gaps that are arising um, in, our, in our analysis. Um, but other times, the, the, the answers will be in the data that we have already uh, collected. We can also, of course, include participant quotes in these more conceptual memos, uh, but here they are more, much more illustrative uh, rather than descriptive. So here is an example of a more conceptual memo. This is in the book. Uh, so this moves that same code on from the more preparatory uh, version uh, that we saw earlier. And as you can see here, I am focused on delineating the properties of consciously or unconsciously progressing to higher education for these students from different social class backgrounds. I'm focusing on identifying the conditions under which the different types of progression to higher education occurs. Um, examining its antecedents or genesis, in other words, where does it come from? What are the factors preceding this? Um, as well as its consequences or implications. So what does this lead to? So the questions that I asked of my data here, the kind of conceptual level questions, required me to go back to my data and indeed for some parts to go back to the field to collect more data to, through theoretical sampling. Now we can also 
use this level of memoing, conceptual memoing to, memoing, to consider the application of a particular sensitizing concept. So what we mean by this in grounded theory terms is a key concept uh, from previous empirical research in the substantive area of our research or from a theory that we feel is becoming relevant, that you're starting to see it in your data. Now, from grounded theory perspective, we certainly don't just paste it on or use it as a code in our coding. Instead, we play with it a little bit. We examine if and especially how it applies so that perhaps we can further refine that concept, articulate it how it is enacted in our particular area and thus contribute to the knowledge field. And we do this thinking and writing in our conceptual memos. So moving on now to the role of diagramming in memoing. In this chapter, I also talk about how they have a relatively symbiotic relationship. They support and enhance each other. Now we can use diagramming at any stage in the research process, and it works wonderfully well in helping us to visualize aspects of our analysis and in thinking more conceptually. Certainly in my own research, in my grounded theory research, I have found diagramming extremely useful, helping me to chart and see what's going on in my data and to clarify relationships. And for me, it is not just to clarify relationships, but also to initially explore them, then going back to data to check them and to clarify them. For me, it has certainly helped to bridge that difficult gap that sometimes exists between coding and then going on to conceptual uh, development. So here's an example um, of a finished diagram. Now, of course, this went through lots of iterations. This is one that's included in the book. But here I'm focused on sketching out the relationships between concepts in the data. Here I was actively exploring the antecedents or the genesis, the before parts, if you like, what led to um, this approach, this, this conscious or unconscious progression approach to higher education. And then eventually, and I explore that elsewhere, the implications for this type of approach to, to higher education. Now, finally, I move to another focus of my chapter, uh, critical analytical mem memoing, um, and how we can use memoing to assist us as researchers in becoming more critically reflexive in our research and why that matters. Certainly in constructivist grounded theory, researcher positionality, positionalities, and impact on data um, is a core consideration requiring critical reflexivity. Who we are and what we bring to the research process impacts upon the data we collect, our relationship with participants, how we analyze the data, and of course, what we see um, in the data and how we interpret. So what I argue in the chapter is that we can use our memos in a critical way. We can use them to critically interrogate our positionalities, our preconceptions, and to put this information on the table, as Adele Clark has said. Now, in reflective journaling, of course, we may indeed do some of this, but critical analytic memoing allows us a space to generate this reflexivity, not just about who we are, but how this has influenced the research, including our relationships with participants. So in our memos, we ask these critical questions, if and in what ways and how our position, our positions have impacted on the data we collected, what we have seen and are seeing and are interpreting in the data. For me, it certainly has helped me to see connections between my own past personal and professional experiences, my interest in a particular area of research, as well as helping me to see myself as a co-participant in the research process and to articulate, in fact, um, my positionality in the research process. It also, I think, facilitates a private conversation between me as researcher um, and me as person, if you like, in that personal theoretical and back again journey um, in which we all participate. You might also consider, for example, including then in terms of how you use that in the final write-up of your research, including perhaps a critical autobiographical ref reflection based on some of your critical analytic memos in the writing up of your research. Now, this work is challenging, and I, I talk about this in some other publications as well. In the area, it certainly can make you feel vulnerable putting yourself out there, the personal self in the public realm, as Grumet talks about. But this is very necessary work, and it's certainly very rewarding um, in terms of both um, authenticity and reciprocity in the research process, which are fundamental aspects of constructivist approaches. 
um, and I've just included an example for the book uh, from the book there that was also uh, previously published that we had uh, permissions from uh, to do. So just to wrap up then, in conclusion, memoing is a wonderful generative tool in qualitative research. I think too often we think about it as just you know, recording our thoughts, but actually um, engaging in memoing is a generative tool. It helps produce our thoughts. Um, it allows us to generate new ideas, not just to record them. Um, I suppose a key po point that we made, and um, it's certainly important advice, is that uh, to allow yourself freedom in your memoing, this is a conversation about between yourself um, and yourself, essentially. So allow yourself the freedom there. And remember that early memos don't necessarily have to uh, be too uh, conceptual in nature. You can store the data to just start somewhere and to start you being able to see those conceptual links that, um, and before you can make them more analytical. I definitely recommend you try out diagramming um, to start charting and seeing and generating the conceptual links um, in your data. Um, and as well as that, to use to start thinking about using memos to reflect upon your own positionality and seeing how that um, impacts. So I can't uh, encourage you enough to get your hands on um, a copy of uh, this great book. There are wonderful chapters in it. Uh, they are both, uh, they're wonderful for understanding the research process and for getting really good practical tips for enacting them. So very best of luck um, in, your, in your research process. Um, and thank you so much for, for joining me uh, today. And hopefully the recorded presentation isn't too jarring along with the live ones. Um, and if I'm awake in the middle of the night on Friday night, I will certainly join you for some discussion. All right. Well, really exciting to be part of this session. Uh, my name is Jamie Fiddler. I am a member of the Métis Nation of Alberta. And I am currently an instructor at the Workman School in Education in Calgary, Alberta, Canada. Um, it has been really wonderful to be a part of this book. The, the process has been really amazing and supportive. So I'm really thankful to the editors for that and excited today to meet some of the other contributors. Although I was really looking forward to getting to mingle with everybody and to, to celebrate in person, but another time. Um, so in my work at the Workland School of Education, I'm most often teaching in the Masters of Education program and the research courses specifically. And so one thing I ask these beginning researchers to do is to really think about their early memories of research. Uh, when I was a beginning researcher, especially in thinking about qualitative ways of working with data, uh, one really challenging part was to think about how I was working with the data and how that aligned to uh, the qualitative paradigms I was working within. And what I, what I found was that I did have some pretty deeply embedded preconceived notions about what research is. And it's not hard to figure out why I had these preconceptions. So I'll invite you to look at some of the images on this slide. Uh, these were retrieved from a Google image search of the word researcher. And then I added that search parameter to have to look for images that were under the Creative Commons license. And these are the first that came up. And likely this is not what people here think of when they think of research, or at least it's not the only thing we think about. Um, but if we think back to our early elementary school experiences, I think these are the kinds of things uh, that we associated with research. And you'll notice in these images, uh, there's no people, you know, there's only the researcher, maybe some, uh, some other researchers or beginning researchers. And it's, it's about looking for something uh, that is concrete, that's out there, you know, that that tr scientific truth, or looking into the archives for something. And when I ask my MED students about their early experiences, these are the same stories I get. They're looking, they were looking for something in an encyclopedia, uh, or they were conducting a science experiment, or uh, maybe a survey of some kind, but even a survey doesn't require human interaction. So in the study that I shared in my chapter, I was working, I share the story of working with in a narrative inquiry methodology. And this methodology as conceptualized by Jean Clendenin and Michael Connolly is really steeped in a doing an ontology of experience. And I will briefly outline what this means. But in that kind of paradigm, I really had to think about 
what is the role of the researcher and how is it different from the one in those images? What is the role of object objectivity? And of course, uh, what does data analysis look like in an ontology of experience like the one uh, Judy theorized for us? So narrative inquirers view experience as, as transactional or as happening in interaction. And this means in an interaction with others and also in context as well. And experience is also seen as, as continuous rather than episodic. So we have, we have experience that continues over time. And do we also mention that the reason why we perceive some parts of experience as different than others is because there's a certain aesthetic or emotional quality that separates out unexperience from experience as a whole. So to do that emotional coloring was also really important, an important part of experience. So, so do we use the metaphor of a river to help us understand these qualities? And I, I find that's really useful. So in these three images, we can clearly see the impact of context on the qualities or the experiences that the water is having. So in the first image, water is rushing down off a rocky cliff. In the second image, the water is in a rather peaceful lake. And in the third image, um, the context is very cold and very steep as well, and also very rocky. So in each of these settings, we can see that that relationship with what's happening around the water is really important. And in terms of continuity, like our experiences, um, what's happening now in these images really sets up the parameters of what's even possible in those later experiences. For example, in the first image of, of water falling from a height at that rapid speed, uh, we know it would take a great deal of time uh, before the water ended up looking as peaceful and as tranquil as, as the lake, for example, uh, because that, that action of falling is setting up what's possible in the future. So that's the continuity bit. So this ontology of experience or this view of experience has some implications for research. So if we're wanting to understand the storied experiences of an individual or a group of people, then it's first really important we don't ignore that context. That context has huge influence. Those relationships that a person has are also really influential. We also have to seek to understand the continuous nature of experiences that the past, the present, and also an imagined future. Uh, we have to inquire into all of that in order to understand experience. And finally, really important to consider the aesthetic dimensions of experience or the emotions of an experience. And in some research processes, um, all three of these things might just get bracketed out or might be considered irrelevant. So uh, what, I, what I share in the chapter is sort of my realization that this had some real implications for researchers as well, uh, because we are in relationship with participants, unlike in some other uh, research settings, we, we are forming those relationships and that of course has its own impact. Uh, researchers also bring their own storied experiences with them. And um, those things, that relationship and our own experiences really can't be written out. They're part of the research as well. So I'll share a little bit now uh, about the study that I shared in the chapter. Uh, so this was uh, a narrative inquiry called Teachers' Experiences of Negotiating Stories to Stay By. And the wonder that drew me to this research was that I had earlier studied early career teacher attrition. And I found that, uh, of course, we know that those beginning experiences can be so challenging uh, that many beginning teachers choose to leave the profession. And I thought about how experiences continue. And I thought, well, how do those, challenge, how do those challenging beginnings influence um, the practice of teachers who stay? How do they metabolize those beginning experiences? Or how do those experiences still, still continue or have influence? And so when I was designing that inquiry, I had this uh, doing an ontology of experience in mind. And um, I, so I realized a few things that um, I needed a longer data collection period. And this is common in narrative inquiry that um, will engage with research participants over a period of time. In my case, it was a year. Um, in order to, to really explore the relationship, relational aspect, I actually invited three participants, later research friends, to engage in research conversations over the course of that year. And then in terms of the aesthetic dimensions, um, I offered during those conversations, sometimes some really some art space activities or other activities that would allow us to explore some of the emotional landscape of their experiences. And the other thing was that um, during our research conversations, I was really careful not to, to bracket out any discussion of anything that was happening in the lives of my research friend, because I knew that that context piece uh, was so key. And then I got to the data analysis part of the research. After all of that careful planning, 
And uh, after the first conversation I had with my three research friends, I transcribed the conversation. Uh, that was my, my instinct. And I ended up uh, with a transcript and I, I was trying to read it. And the first thing I tried to do is kind of try to sort out what's important and what's not. Um, but yet I had set up an inquiry where everything was important. And I just, I felt like um, that I needed something a little bit different in this case. So I began to just listen to the research conversations. I think that my own context played a large role in this because I had a really long drive uh, to my research conversations. And so I could actually listen to a two hour research conversation in one go and just kind of absorb what was happening throughout the conversation. And what I started to realize was that that helped me stay in the conversation in a way that was really compelling. Listening to the conversation um, also meant that I was re-listening to all those parts that maybe weren't about teaching, but they still ended up being important to the inquiry. In some cases, there were some really rich metaphors in those side conversations that we had. And also that was where a lot of the emotional landscapes of the conversations were as well. Also, I realized when I was listening, my attention was no longer divided. When I was in the room with my research friends, I always had one part of my mind on just creating the experience. So uh, for example, I made us dinner every time we met. So sometimes that meant uh, part of my brain was, was watching the oven or another part of my brain was making sure everybody had water, everything else they needed to be comfortable. But once I was listening uh, to the recordings, that part of my brain was completely gone and I could just be in the dialogue of the conversation. And that helped me to discover uh, a lot of new meanings and really listen more deeply to what my research friends were saying and also to what they were saying to each other and how their experiences were unfolding over time. Of course though, uh, you know, transcripts are really useful because they also guide us to different parts of the recordings. And I quickly realized I needed a way to find uh, certain parts of the conversation later on as I was doing my analysis. So in this example, when was it that we talked about butterflies and having butterflies in your classroom? So uh, that's when I, I reached back into my brain and I drew upon a technique that I'd learned about in a video ethnography course that I took at UBC with uh, Dr. Lisa Latzenheiser. Because video ethnographers have the same challenge. They want to review the video of their data, but they also want to reference certain parts of the videos later. So I remembered this method called indexing. And I didn't have very much left over from, from that course about the technique that uh, video ethnographers might use exactly. So this is likely wildly different, <laughs> but it was inspired by that. And uh, this process developed over time and it worked for me. So this is an example of an index card which was actually just a page from the journal I always carried around with me that had those perforated pages, uh, a, just a blank notebook. And I would listen to the recording again while not driving, of course. And I would just write a brief summary of what each person was sharing. And periodically, I would write down a timestamp so that later I could go back and really target a certain part that I wanted to listen to again or even to transcribe. And then occasionally, I would uh, leave a little my own thought um, beside it, because this, of course, this was part of the analysis process and, and my mind was going to uh, some of the, the themes, etc. as I was uh, writing these out. And these pictures just show um, the little bulldog clips, each little stack was one research conversation. But then what ended up being really cool is that I could um, pull out a few different cards from the different stacks uh, because they you know, I wanted to work with them in writing, for example, and they would lead me back to the recording so I could do some targeted transcription. And the, the tactile nature of them uh, really kind of fueled what was a creative process. And then when I started moving to research texts, um, as I mentioned, that's when I was doing targeted transcription. I was often using uh, verba verbatim speech from our conversations because I wanted to share a little bit of that conversation with the reader and really to invite the reader into that conversation because it was such a generative place. Um, and I would also share the research texts as they were being developed with my research friends and ask, is there anything I've left out? Does this feel like it, it represents your experiences? Uh, so we it, were able to have those sorts of conversations. And the last thing I'll just mention briefly is just talk about the challenges and also the strengths I experienced with this method. One of the challenges of course is you need a great deal of listening time especially if you have quite a lot of uh, research conversations recorded. 
And, and it is a different feel than transcripts. So it might not always be the best or most expedient way to work with research data. In this one particular uh, research setting, though, I think one of the benefits that ended up being really important for me is that I really felt like I was honoring the stories and experiences that were being shared with me because I was really deeply attending to them and not just the substance of them, of them but also the, the quality of them. When I was listening to the conversations, I could hear that emotion, tension, happiness, frustration. So I was really attending to that aesthetic understanding of experience as well. I'm just going to share my own comments first in response to the presentations and then we'll open it up so that uh, Charlie can facilitate the discussion uh, with the people here. One of the most insightful quotes I ever read was by case study methodologist Robert Stake, who said that good research is not about good methods as much as it is about good thinking. And when Paul Mijas was giving us his presentation on memo writing, one of the things that I think is wonderful is that he gives us very specific guidance. When I read his chapter and I saw the very specific methods that he was outlining, he was helping us with the double hermeneutic. In other words, trying to make meaning of our participants who are trying to make meaning. One of the things about Paul's writing is that he is brilliant and insightful. And the only way that I can think of to get to his level of thinking is to adopt some of his methods, and he outlines those in his chapter. So good thinking is, I think, a result of good methods. So follow Paul's methods in order to get to those higher levels. One of the things about Elaine Keene's presentation was saying that memoing is generative. In fact, writing is thinking, according to some of the people who study that. I appreciate her ability for sticking to the classics. In other words, when Glazer and Strauss originally penned their methods, they weren't all that clear. And I think what Elaine Keene does for us so wonderfully in her chapter is provide that streamlined how-to way of exploring grounded theory, because it's through the primary sources of Glazer and Strauss who weren't all that clear she's able to provide us that clarity and focus, very much like Kathy Sharmas did with her writings in Grounded Theory. She reminded me that the classics never die. And so with her ability to go back to the origins of Grounded Theory makes them all the more accessible for contemporary researchers. I had the honor of working uh, as editor of Jamie Fiddler's chapter, what I was so moved by was her storytelling. In other words, she was telling a story about how she got the story. It was honest and it was vulnerable. She found a beautiful balance between her as the researcher, as a character, and her participants as not the supporting players, but as co-researchers, or as she calls them, research friends. She has a wonderful conceptual framework by staying with the Deweyan concepts uh, throughout her work. And look at those cards. Did you see those cards with the bull clips? I was at the dollar store and I picked up some index cards myself just because I thought if they're good enough for Jamie, they're good enough for me. And so I did that with my own work. One of the things that I find is that she is old school in a contemporary way. Yes, she relied on the index cards to help sort through her data. I was taught, touch the data. As she said, it gives you a sense of intimacy with your data. And so I am not opposed to using index cards over computer software. Software is vital, of course, when it's necessary, when you're dealing with huge amounts of data. But I think Jamie Fiddler was so smart in knowing that if she wants to really be friends with the data, friends are touch each other. They're in contact with each other. Overall, the three presenters 
gave us some insightful ways of thinking. And what I was really impressed with in this book was how we stuck with a very strong how-to through line. We wanted to make the book as pragmatic as possible. And the three presenters that you heard today disclosed their methods, which is so rare to find. Sometimes in analytic works or general textbooks, we get a gloss of how they did it, but we don't really have the details. Here, you have three examples of three wonderful, insightful researchers giving us their ability for transcending into good thinking. Charlie, I will pass it on to you for group facilitation. Hold on. Um, and maybe uh, my first question will be just building on what Johnny said. Um, if Paul and Jamie could talk about um, the relationship in their own work between thinking and method and talking about um, how did your methods shape your thinking? How did your thinking shape your methods? So um, I guess I will start. I've, I've always thought that, um, I, I've always had a tr trouble divorcing analysis from the writing process. I've always felt that writing through something was the way to, to know something. And so I've always sort of abraded analysis, writing and thinking. It's kind of hard for me to separate them in a way. And um, it was kind of hard in, in the chapter that I wrote to to um, just pick two or three or four or five particular kinds of memos because I really wanted to include more and more of them um, because I have other kinds of um, ways of doing memos that I just wasn't able to include in the chapter. But I, I think that from the very beginning, I engage writing. And that's why uh, the document reflection memo, the, the one that I started with, is so important for my work. A couple of years ago, I was working with um, some data around North Carolini Carolinians and access to healthcare. There were, there were maybe a thousand pages of data. I ended up doing a document reflection memo and we ended up, I ended up with 25 memos. So I, I suddenly felt so much more comfortable because I, rather than trying to find all that stuff in the 1,000 pages, going back to those 25 memos really saved my, my sanity that year. And it also helped me kind of document and nail down some of my thoughts so that when I did need to go back to the full, huge stack of, of interviews and files, um, I felt more um, capable and more... Um, in control of finding things, just as Jamie was talking about the timestamps, the memos in a way were a way for me to kind of condense and then go back to the the fuller um, landscape if I needed to. Yes, I can I can I can echo that. And the nice thing about actually writing out the index cards was that it, it started that physical movement of writing. And then sometimes I would jump to slightly longer texts. And then as I was writing up the complete research text, I could, I could work back and forth. And it, it even just the listening, I, that was a huge part of my thinking. So I was, my thinking was developing as my, I was going from listening to writing the index cards to writing a little bit more, reading again. And the nice thing about having a, a long uh, period of time with the, my research friends was that um, Often I'd go back to the conversation and be like, hey, here's what I've been thinking about and writing about, you know, since our last conversation. So that was part of the, the thinking as well. One of the things that I was, became aware of, uh, this was the first time I've ever done Zoom interviews for another project that I was working on. And I learned that Zoom does automatic transcription for you. And I thought, okay, great. I'll try it out. That'll save me some time. Well, of course, Zoom uh, doesn't always get things with 100% accuracy. You still have to listen to the recording. You still have to fine tune everything that it transcribed for you. So even though, yes, it, it does like maybe about 50, 75% at most of the work for you, you've still got to clean up uh, what Zoom could not capture. So you know, even though it's time saving, you're still taking ownership of the data. Yeah. And then um, maybe we could just go to um, build off of that again. Um, so both Paul, both you and Jamie um, talk about um, listening to the data, right? And um, hearing the data. 
maybe could you talk a little bit about that part of your work? How do you, Paul, you're listening to the data through writing through it, through, could you talk about that? So I, I think um, for me, when I'm, when I'm reading and listening to a transcript, as I mentioned, some things just jump out at me. Um, but rather than just holding on to those little pieces, I want to go back to what that what that does to my understanding of the of the bigger, larger landscape of the narrative. And so, um, when I when I see something, I, I for example, from just to give you an example, I'm remembering a, um, an interview with somebody who was undergoing chemotherapy, and she said in a just one one powerful sentence, um, "Cancer has been a blessing and a curse." And so that just kind of resonated in my ears. But then I went back and I read, and, 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 and you know, I, I, I sort of tried to understand the rest of the interview based on that one, what that one declaration. And it really um, helped me so much understand what seemed to be contradictory in the rest of the interview. Um, and so, um, in other words, I'm listening, at the, listening for the small sound bites, but then going back and listening to the bigger story again, or reading it again with a different understanding because that that statement unlocked the mystery of the entire transcript. Yeah, I can say that I, I had similar experiences. I can I can think of one one listening I was doing and I, I started noticing that one of my research friends uh, whose uh, self-selected pseudonym uh, is Carlos was because um, we ended up meeting, having a research conversation at his house and he was talking about how he had a tooth pulled that day at the dentist. So his mouth was swollen in it and it was sore. And also I noticed that he wasn't sitting down, that he was kind of frantically searching through cupboards. He kept asking us uh, quite quickly, does anybody need coffee or tea? And he was, he was actually always quite a fast speaker, but this was even faster than normal. And there was really this sense of like heightened anxiety that um, I wasn't fully aware of uh, when I was there in the room. And, and then later on in the conversation, you know, I heard him talk about some challenging teaching experiences he was having. And I thought, you know, that's not, this is not unrelated. The sound of the cupboard doors rapidly slamming, you know, was a cue, one that I would have missed uh, in a transcript, but also that that told me a lot. And that story of, of having a, pooth, to, a tooth pulled, you know, actually, became a, a metaphor that I worked around and played around with in order to understand Carlos's experiences more deeply. So, so listening to the data, I mean, it was, it was just so, it was just so rich. Um, Jamie, you came to our class and um, my students were so impressed by um, your work and your, the rigor of the work. Could you talk a little bit about um, like just those long drives. Like I just um, like I just was so fascinated with this idea of um, you know dropping that recording and doing that long drive. Um, like how, talk about that. So I think that probably everybody can relate to that soundtrack moment of the long drive, right? Like you put in a one of your favorite albums or or something that you want to listen to, a podcast or a book, and you can just kind of get lost in it. And it, it was exactly the same um, with listening to the conversation. It was like, uh, you know, I was I was hearing myself even as part of the conversation, but really it was like it was like being there again, and also and also not also being kind of lost in that that soundtrack moment. And and now um, I'm using the same uh, method of data analysis with some more recent research conversations I have, but I don't have those long drives, so. I started taking long walks because I do think that 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 was important, you know, that allowing yourself to be in a space uh, where you can get a little bit lost, you know, where it is kind of a soundtrack moment, I, I think was was important. Do either of you like create auditory memos? So do you speak your memos rather than write the memo? I, I, I don't I don't record um, my memos, I like to write them out. I think part of it is because I really like something about my fingers, getting my fingers on a keyboard or on a pen does something for, for my brain. And it's been that way my whole life. And so um, the minute, and, and I like being able to sort of erase a word or 
or uh, go back and it's like um, verbs are really important to me um, when I'm writing memos. Like, what is that? What is that verb? That action? That process? What's moving things? And I oftentimes notice that I don't get it right the first or second time, but then I go back and and um, I, I like doing that. I, it would be much harder to do that with an audio version of the memo. We actually have in the book a chapter on oral coding. So on an attempt to really use verbal auditory data and auditory responses in sort of a rigorous way. In our book, the, the core idea is that as Johnny said, it's like good thinking creates good research. Research or decision making, slowing it down, trying to find, to learn how to find that kind. Of